All right, so here's our outline. There is a wealth of things that you can do when it comes to teaching cybersecurity with science fiction. We'll talk about the why here in just a second. I'll introduce myself, but we have literally been getting great examples of how to teach uh, you know, cybersecurity and technology security since like the 1960s. Well, probably before that, right? Think about the very first black and white films. Uh, they, they taught us something, right? And as humans, we love stories. And so, you know, if you're going to teach an audience, and I, I get this question often, is how do you how do you train users? How do you turn users into your first line of cyber defense? Well, to me, it starts with a good story that they remember, and once they remember it right? You can then, you can then, you can grab them. You can make sure that they understand that cybersecurity and security in general is not just my job or, you know, everybody else's job that's here, right? That's some of the stuff that we're doing here or the folks that want to get a job and do that stuff, right? It's everybody's job. It should just be part of the way we do business today. So who am I? Uh, so I'm Brad Rhodes. I am, uh, I do lots of things um, as, as many of the folks in the uh, the chat pod would probably tell you, Jackson, Jan, and others. Um, I work for Accenture, um, really awesome, great company. We're hiring, so uh, please hit us up and hit me up if you're you're looking for stuff. Um, great opportunities there. Um, as a veteran, I am a colonel uh, in the Army Reserve now. I moved over from the Guard to the Reserve. I'm a cyber warfare officer, and right now I am the Chief Information Operations Officer for a division uh, in the Army Reserve, which is really interesting because I've got 7,000 people who like to click on things. So what I'm what I'm going through today is something that I, I use with my users in real life. So definitely good stuff. Um, so uh, I, I'm part of MCPA, Military Cyber Professionals Association. It's a sister organization to VetSecCon or VetSec. Really great stuff, right? If you're interested in that, hit me up there. I teach, I coach, way too many pro certs because other people paid for them. And I'm an amateur radio operator, KG4, Charlie Oscar Sierra. So if you're an amateur radio operator out there, um, you might find me on the airways as well. And then I try to post all my stuff on GitHub and things like that. And I, I'm, I sat in, I was in Jax's presentation. I'm going to do way better with LinkedIn now because of that. So I'm super excited. So um, I will, for fun, here's my uh, paste in the pot chat pod. Here is my LinkedIn. Welcome to connect with everybody here. Happy to chit chat about all sorts of things, cyber and everything like that. All right. So why? Why should you use science fiction to teach cybersecurity? So first off, science fiction has absolutely 100% influenced technology. If you have one of these here fancy devices, it was it came from Star Trek, right? The, the even the original flip phones looked like the Star Trek communicators, and and uh, example Star one of my favorites is Star Trek: The Next Generation. We have iPads and you know Amazon Kindles and anything that's a tablet like thing. We have those because. I think Steve Jobs was watching a Star Trek The Next Generation episode and he saw Captain Picard, you know, reading something on this digital pad and signing stuff. And we know that was all fake, right? But Steve Jobs said, we should do something like that. And now we have it, right? Another reason, everybody loves stories, right? As humans, right? This is like the, the, the social engineering part of this, right? I was in another session and, and somebody said that psychological operations was, uh, was simply marketing for the army. It's so cute. I chuckled about that, right? I'm an information operations officer as well in my army life. And um, yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. Um, different kind of marketing, but the same principles apply. But everybody loves a good story. And if I give you a good story as a cybersecurity professional, we're going to take, we want, well, you know, one of the things that we do really poorly right now in the industry, in my estimation, is we like to sell things and have been for a long time on FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And when you only, when you are, you know, Debbie Downer, the boy that cried wolf, the person that's always negative about what's happening, people begin to turn you off. Uh, and so FUD, I think, is going out the window. We have got to figure out another way beyond FUD. And I think this is one of those places we can do that. Science, there really is science in science fiction. If you look at some of the more recent science fiction movies, um, there is honest to goodness, real science in them. Um, it is, it's one of those things that, um, uh, interstellar, interstellar, um, Kip Thorne, who wrote the book on black holes, right? Gigantor in the, the black hole in, in that movie is literally ripped from his book, 
right? The way they visualized that and built that thing so you could get a feel for what a black hole actually looks like, it's from the book. And then we go look at the pictures of black holes in real life that we've gathered, and oh my gosh, it almost looks like exactly the same thing. It's pretty crazy, right? But there is science and science fiction, right? Another thing that I want to hit on here, right, is that education doesn't have to be boring. All right, okay, so everybody here, you know, you can give me the, the laughing icon, the razor, I don't care, the, the clap icon, whatever, right? Have you ever been to a cybersecurity training or even any class or any education, right? Any education that, uh, you know, seminar or, or college class or whatever, and you sat there and you were bored out of your mind, okay? I have been to many of those and it's 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 not good because you don't remember anything from those classes. I think I have um I've taken a lot of classes over the years and trainings and stuff like that. And the ones that I remember are stuff that I use because they were fun and exciting and hands-on. And I could I could have a conversation with the instructor, but the ones that are were boring and I don't remember any of those, I've forgotten about all of that. Right. And ultimately, cybersecurity training should be memorable. Everybody loves stories. Everybody loves the movies. Everybody goes to a movie or watches, you know, or, you know, or, or, or streams your favorite movie. So much Star Trek and Star Wars content right now. I'm super jazzed. Um, you stream that and you, you do that and you remember things. And so if you can, as a cybersecurity professional, professional, bring in some of those things into the way you train your users, man, you're going to catch them. You're going to grab them and they're going to remember and they're hopefully not going to click on that stuff. All right. So let's jump on in. 1969 and 2003. So believe it or not, as I went back and built this presentation, uh, one of the things I looked at was for good examples going back a ways, right? Going back a ways. The original Italian job. So what? it's not 2003. It was actually 1969 with uh, Academy Award winner Michael Caine. Um, and believe it or not, in the 1960s, we were doing, quote unquote, what we would call smart cities today. We were automating in the 1960s traffic lights, right? We had traffic control centers back then. Most people don't realize that. Well, in the original, the original um, Italian job, they actually, no kidding, part of their getaway plan was to break these automated systems that were run by like computers now computers bigger than you know my room that i'm sitting in right now at my home office they were they built they, they they hacked these machines so that they could get away right they did the redux of that a little bit more advanced in the 2003 uh, italian job but if you want to ever explain to somebody smart city hacking this is a great this is a great sort of reference point absolutely a great reference point what we got a whole lot of movies we got a whole lot of references to cover and please feel free to take all of these and use them in your training with your with your users Ah, War Games, 1983. Everybody, right, do you want to play a game, right? So again, of course we wanted to play a game and it, it turned out really, really bad. And I love the fact, and for all of my veterans here, right, we love acronyms, right? And so you watch some of these movies and you find these acronyms like uh, the, the, the Whopper, the War Operation Plan Response. I'm going to date myself, uh, or maybe I'm dating back to my, my parents' generation, but if you told a lie... Right back back then, right? It, it might be called a whopper, right? So this was this was you know a little bit of play on words that the movie makers made here. But war games, war games. I like to use war games to talk about bug bounty programs. Think about it, right? If you had a bug bounty program and Matthew Broderick's character in the movie uh, could instead of you know doing what he was doing, which was war dialing at the time, and then connecting to random computers. What if he was an ethical guy and said, you know what, I'm going to call someone and tell them that they have an exposed system on the internet that they might want to secure, right? So bug bounty programs is a way to look at sort of war games. And what I'm trying to do here is look at, think about all of these cool movies and shows and memorable stories, and then bring them back into a way to educate people when it comes to cybersecurity. Die Hard. Okay, quick poll. Is Die Hard a Christmas movie? Right? Everybody's got t-shirts now. Have you seen these t-shirts? <laughs> yeah, George is like, yes, we got a whole bunch. Of yes, yes, thank you. Sometimes I get arguments about this one. Is Die Hard a Christmas movie? I and have you seen the t-shirts, right? You know, it's not it's not Christmas until until you, and, until uh, the, the terrorist falls, you know, off of Nakatomi Tower, right? Hans Gruber, right? You know, and one of my favorite bits about Die Hard is there's a part in the movie, and if you haven't seen it, 
well, you should watch it. But if you haven't seen it, there's a part in the movie where um, where Hans Gruber, um, uh, Alan Rickman does this really terrible, you know, American accent. And if you go back and watch sort of behind the scenes in the movie, that was completely ad-libbed. And the producers and the director thought it was so funny that they left it in the movie. Uh, because it was just completely ad-libbed. It was great, right? So these things happen. But what is Die Hard really about? Die Hard is about physical access to a building control system to get access to a vault, right? And so this one was a this one Die Hard really really ahead of its time. It literally had you know our favorite hacker here going in and breaking the building control systems. Today today we have automated building control systems to the point that that this thing could actually happen. Right. In fact, in 2018, I was working on the the Colorado Department of Transportation ransomware incident and actually saw this in real life. One of the boxes that controlled the building access systems right in, uh, you know, in uh, for for the CDOT headquarters was a was an old Windows XP system. No, I'm I'm not making this up. Um, And it got hit with the ransomware and all the doors did what they were supposed to do. They failed open. But they could not secure them after that. So they had to have a roving patrol. It's crazy, right? But again, this is a great example. So if you want to explain to people why we should secure building control systems and why it's not a bad thing to put your HVAC system on the internet, but it's also a really bad thing to put your HVAC system on the internet. Grab some clips, show them, hey, look at what if somebody were to physically make a physical incursion in our building and break a bunch of our stuff? Hackers. Okay. Okay. Anybody? Okay. Has anybody watched Hackers? Right, everybody's. If you're like my generation, you watch Hackers. Now, granted, is Hackers a great movie? No, it's a terrible movie. However, that whole boat thing, like I got the boat picture on there, right, is actually can happen today. In fact, in 2019, right, you could actually grab the scene where the where the you know the the threat actor is threatening to you know turn over these you know tankers on their way into port to cause the world's greatest disaster ever. Well. In 2019, the United States Coast Guard, if you didn't know, if there's any Coasties in the room, thanks for your service. Um, The Coast Guard put out its very first cybersecurity, and this is summer of 2019, cybersecurity warning or assessment. What had happened was, is there was a freighter on the way back uh, from across the, you know, across the Atlantic from Europe into New York Harbor that had been hit with some significant malware. Because the the folks on the ship, and nobody thinks about this, the folks on the ship were checking their email on the same network, right? They were checking their Gmail on the same network that was the, that held the navigation system and the control systems for the ship. They hadn't segmented. And they had lost control of the ship. They had to shut all of the systems down and literally do stuff manually. No kidding. This actually happened. So hackers can actually happen today. So go back and rewatch it. It might be some fun stuff to uh, think. The tagline there, boot up or shut up, is really sad, actually. But it's one of those movies that you go back in time and you look at it now and you go, oh, my gosh, we're actually there. Um, Independence Day. Independence Day. So I'm going to tell you a funny war story about Independence Day. In, and I'm going to date myself. In 1996, I was at advanced camp at uh, any ROTC commissionees, right? At advanced camp, right? And from 1996, I'm not, wouldn't be surprised if there are. So I was, I commissioned through ROTC. I went to advanced camp at Fort Lewis, Washington, and I'm up there. And on the 4th of July, we actually got that day off at advanced camp because it was a federal holiday and nobody wanted to work. And so all of the cadets, all my fellow cadets and I, we went to the movie theater in Tacoma, Washington, and we watched Independence Day. Let me tell you something. Right, nothing like a bunch of Army ROTC cadets wanting to kill aliens. When we got back from that movie, we we're like, "Yeah, we're gonna get some aliens. We're gonna kick some butt." It was super awesome. We were super motivated. It got us through the rest of um, it got us through the rest of advance camp. Um, because I don't have one time at band camp stories. I have one time at advance camp stories. Um, and so Independence Day is a hilarious ish kind of thing. So at the end of Independence Day, how did they stop the bad guys and the aliens? What did they do? They hacked an exposed application programming interface that looked oddly like Linux. Now, I don't know where these aliens got their Linux operating systems from or that they knew about APIs, but I'm telling you, this is bad, right? So 
you know, if you're if you want to teach somebody about, you know, a developer about why you shouldn't have exposed and unsecured APIs on the internet or other systems, right? This is a great scene, right? Yep, they get hooked up with the the alien ship, and all of a sudden, right, they're in the system. Well, no kidding, this can happen in real life, right? So this is a fun, exciting way to, you know, educate your users and your developers on why they should secure their stuff. <laughs> Office space. Has anybody seen my? Has anybody seen you know the stapler? Has anybody seen stuff like that? I mean, ever that's right. So like, turn in your TPS reports. It'll be great. Salami slicing. That's what this movie was all about. If you didn't know, it's a funny movie, and it's all about you know office life. And office life is one of those movies that if you've ever walked in, worked in an office, right, you have seen people like are in office space. You had the you know the buy the books boss, and you had the rebel. But in the end, this is all about salami slicing. This is about this is about how to teach, right what an insider could do to your organization by simply moving a few pennies off the books, you know, over time. At the end of this, when the whole thing burned down, they walked away with hundreds of thousands of dollars. Don't let this be your organization, right? This is a this is why we look at insider threats. This is why it's important that we do a background check so we bring in employees. All of that stuff, you can teach that with office space. And Ron, I'm sorry that you live in office space. <laughs> there are many people out there like that. You are not alone, I promise. Ah, yes. Yes, 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 yes. The Matrix, right? Matrix, one of my favorite movies. Um, Matrix 4 was interesting and weird all at the same time, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll save that. The Matrix. But if you want to teach about malicious insiders, use Cypher from The Matrix. He was the quintessential malicious insider and he sold his friends out for a fake stake. He sold his friends out for a fake stake. I want you to think about this. This dude wanted to eat steak again, and he totally took. There are people in the world that will sell your, your organization down the river uh, if they can. So if you want to educate people on what a malicious insider looks like, well, they're probably not going to look as cool as Joe Pags here, but, right, he's cool. And yes, folks, yes, Trinity used Nmap. She did. Now, granted, I don't know how well she did uh, Nmap, but she did. She absolutely used Nmap. You can see it scrolling in the background of the screen. Just zoom in on that part of the movie. It's kind of fun. But again, if you want to teach somebody what it is to, you know, why we need to think about malicious insiders, this is a great movie. Battlestar Galactica, right? This is the new one, right? I know there's the old one. I got some, I'm sure there's some old school people here, but I love the new one as well. I thought they were, I thought they did a great job and, and things like that. But Battlestar Galactica, I love this one for network segmentation. Because in the end, and we know there's a we know that Baltar did bad things. Hopefully, I'm not giving it away. If you haven't watched it, you should. But if you watch the, the miniseries uh, uh, from sci-fi, um, Commander Adama says, You're not putting a network on my Battlestar. I don't care how secure you think it is. I have made sure that I have no connectivity so cuz the battle starts a gigantic industrial control system i have no connectivity for my systems because i know what the cylons can do and the cylons were all doing cyber attacks so if you ever watch battlestar galactica you get to this next part here where all of these vipers the new ones the fancy new ones right so there's something to be said for you know having some older tech around i guess but the fancy new vipers were all networked and as soon as they got zapped by the EW weapon that the Silence had that delivered the, the malware to their ships, they were all dead, right? And so this is a great example of if it's networked, it can be hacked. I don't care if you think you've segmented it off. I don't care if you think that, you know, your sensor for, you know, your sensor system that has like a Wi-Fi access connection for, say, your industrial control system out in the middle of nowhere, like a, a pump or a, an electrical grid component or something like that that somebody just drives up to and logs in and checks, right? I'm here to tell you, if you have anything connected to the internet, any RF out there, anything, somebody's already poked at it. And if they haven't already poked at it, they're going to. Right. And don't think that if you don't have a domain, you just have IP addresses out there that they're not going to find you because they will. OK, you can all laugh about this one. Right. If you got kids, have you seen G-Force? Have you seen G-Force? Right. If you if you if you've not, you should watch it. OK, so maybe you won't. This is a really, really funny Disney movie. G-Force is G-Force is the guinea pigs. Right. These are the 
baddest guinea pigs on the face of the planet. They're special for Jax. This is for you. They're special forces guinea pigs. Um, and they are um they are they are like they they are defending the universe or the world against an internet of things supply chain event. And if you watch this movie, and hopefully I don't give it too much away. If you haven't watched it, watch it with your kids to laugh. It's kind of educational. Well, this company that is run by well, we'll just circle this bad guy right here. He's an insider. Um, he creates this front company that gets all of this stuff into the supply chain. And then all of a sudden, Internet of Things blows up in your face. And all of a sudden, you've got like, you know, your 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 fridge and your crock pot and your toaster and your blender all goes crazy. Now, is that not true to life today? Right? You can go on Amazon right now and you can see... <laughs> You can buy an internet-enabled crockpot. I want to get one just so I can see if I can, you know, burn somebody's roast, right? So those things are out there. So we are connecting so much stuff to the internet, right? We don't think about it, right? We This is a great way to educate not only your users. And, and oh, by the way, folks, this is one of those ones where we think about like shadow IT, where all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of stuff in your spaces that people are using. Like how many people would allow you know, she who shall not be named into their, uh, you know, into their, their office space uh, at work. So you don't have to answer that question, but I know there's a bunch of organizations out there that don't really care, right? And those things are dangerous. IoT is one of those things that, you know, it, if you're a, if you're building a Wi-Fi enabled crockpot, I'm pretty sure you're not doing great on cybersecurity. I'm not saying they're bad crockpots. I'm just saying, if your forte is building a piece of hardware to do to you know to cook a roast, right? I'm pretty sure that you're not super great on the whole, you know, cybersecurity thing. Just saying, just saying. All right, next. Mr. Robot, I saw a reference to Mr. Robot up there, right? Um, I love Mr. Robot. The for the second, the last two seasons get really weird and out there, right? But the first two seasons are pretty awesome. Um, and the, the, one of the things, one of the techniques they do in this series is they do the usb uh stick drop does that still work today you darn right it does right people will pick up anything cool that you drop in a parking lot and if it's something like especially and here's the thing right these things are cheap folks 256 gig you know memory stick right there there you can get one for like five bucks at, or seven bucks at micro center uh, inflation right you know what? You get a few of those, put some bad stuff on it, drop it in a parking lot, see what happens, right? Great for physical pen testing. Um, also, think about like they use the raspberry. Yeah, don't take any from strangers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you got the raspberry pie there uh, that you saw in Mr. Robot. Love it, right? I mean, he, you know, this is things, right? There is technology and tools out there today that you can do a lot with that most people don't think about, right? So again, if you, again, these are some great things right there in terms of that. Um, you know, I, I, it was a little cheesy in Mr. Robot, you know, what's your favorite, you know, do you like, a, do you like KDE or do you like Gnome? I thought that was kind of cheesy, but kind of, I think all of us there were like, oh, that's kind of funny, but weird all at the same time. Um, another one, and this is a, this is an interesting one. So we live in a world today where we see a lot of, you know, disinformation, misinformation, and malinformation, right? In information is not inherently bad right? It's the intent that's used behind it. And so when we see, you know, misinformation, disinformation, right? Sometimes we don't even get, we don't even see it. We don't even think about it, right? The Orville, which is some would argue is doing, was doing until some of the new Star Trek shows doing Star Trek better than Star Trek did. Um, but they went to this planet and on this planet, it was all based on um, social media, right? And the fact that you could get, you know, you know, we'll say reprogrammed, you know, if you didn't have a high enough social media score based on something that you did. Now, doesn't that sound like something we're dealing with today? It does. And you've got to educate your users, right? Misinformation and disinformation can have a direct impact on your company or your organization if you're not paying attention to it. And like Jax talked about in her presentation, you know, social media is a thing that we as professionals have to leverage. And we have to, in many cases in the cybersecurity space, think about this before, you know, our C-suites do because they're not necessarily thinking about it, right? This is where we get into how much information do you actually decide to put on your website as well. Um, and I'll give you a practical example of disinformation. Um, 
back when I was out, uh, 2019, 2019, 2020 time frame, I was out doing a national mission at Cybercom. Um, and I had a crew and I went on, I would go in and check on the holidays and bring donuts and check on my folks and make sure everything was okay. So I'll tell you what, right? <laughs> I, I'm, I, I, was, I was checking the socials, right? And I ran across a, a post that had been reposted by the veterans of foreign wars. And the post was an angel fire, right? And if you're in the military, you, you know what an angel fire is. That's when you, you know, you have an aircraft like a C-130 or C-17 kick off, you know, take off at like an air show, right? And then they'll kick flares out of the back of the aircraft and it looks like an angel flying through the sky. It is pretty darn cool, right? It is one of those things that that's really neat to see. There was one problem. And this is why, you know, this disinformation, misinformation thing is so important. There was one problem. It wasn't a U.S. aircraft. It was a Russian transport. And in fact, if I if I if I'd taken the time to chase it, my guess is that the VFW got totally trolled by Russian threat actors that day. And and there was like ten thousand likes because people just didn't know, right? So you gotta be careful. You gotta check your sources. Don't believe it's like that old that old um, uh, insurance commercial, right? Don't believe everything on the internet. I'm not a French hand model today. Bonjour, I promise. Um, but just, you know, you got to pay attention to that and you got to educate your users. Ready Player One, VR. VR is all the rage today, right? I'd love getting for it when you're talking about VR. And, you know, I'm not going to go deep on this one here, but VR is one of those things you got to think about. And here's the thing. I have some friends of mine. They do great research into this. Virtual reality back probably a couple of years ago, had huge security holes. It's getting better, but there are still huge security holes. You can actually get into a virtual, you as a hacker or a pen tester can actually get into a virtual reality session and serve malicious ad content. Did you know that, right? This can actually happen, right? This can actually happen. It is crazy. So VR is great. And if your company's investing in VR, you got to secure it just like everything else. We've got to secure it. All right. So my two favorite things, I'm wearing a Star Trek outfit today. I could have just as easily put on an Obi-Wan Kenobi outfit. Um, but let's jump about in into the two big ones, the two big properties in, in sci-fi today that really launched everything, Star Trek and Star Wars. Um, I love Star Trek. I love Star Wars. I love both, right? So, you know, so, you know, so Trekkies, you know, Trekkies, raise your hand, right? You know what? Yep. If you got some Trekkies in the room, right? I'm sure there's some Trekkies, right? So, you know, Star Wars folks in their hand. I get, I usually get about a, it's really interesting when I do this, when I've done this, I did this presentation live a couple of months back, um, had an opportunity to do that. And I got about a 50 50 split. So it's kind of fun, right? Um, so, Star Trek in Star Trek. So, this is a scene from Star Trek 2 where you should change your passwords, right? If you've watched Star Trek 2, if you haven't, you should, right? This is the Wrath of Khan, the original one. And what's happening here is the Reliant has literally just put a pasting on the USS Enterprise. And they are going to, you know, they, they, they've decided that the only way that they can fight back is by hacking the, 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 the USS Reliance, Khan ship's command console. And they're hoping that he hasn't changed his password. And he didn't. And so they were able to tell the Reliant to lower their shields and 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 you know save the day, right? With one the, that code one six three zero nine, right? They changed their password, right? If they had changed their password, maybe Star Trek ends right there. Don't know, but you got to change your passwords. Great scene to you, help your users understand the why, right? Deceptions in honeypots, right? Everybody knows the scene, God, right? You know, he's all angry and stuff like that. But what was really important here is when he talks to the ship, he says to, he says to Scotty, tell him, tell me, how long is it going to take to fix the ship? And Scotty says, well, or Scott, Spock says, well, Admiral, by the book, it's going to take us six days to get that done. It's going to take us two days to do that. And we are stuck in space. That was a little bit of deception right there. Because a few hours later, two hours later, they pick up the they pick up the communicator, they talk to the ship, and they get beamed aboard. And Lieutenant Savick's like, How the heck did this happen? And and Admiral Kirk says, Hey, we don't, we, we were talking in code. You just you're just not part of that, right? And so the other thing to think about here is honeypots, right? Lure them in, right? This is a, a great example, sort of one of those, those re, sort of those like you know, in reality examples of why we use a honeypot or a honey net. 
right? We were able to, you know, they were able to suck Khan into this to make him think that he was going to catch the Enterprise. But in the end, they got to the Mutar Nebula and, you know, were able to stop Khan's rampage. Ah, Star Trek is, I love Star Trek for defense and depth discussions, right? They have shields, right? And in fact, Jen Easterly at SZA grab and that shields up thing, right? Especially once the, the Ukraine-Russia conflict kicked off, right? Shields up, right? So when you think about the shifts in Star Trek, they've got these electrical, you know, they've got these, you know, these shields that they put up that, you know, generates a, you know, some sort of, you know, electrical thing that deflects, you know, phasers and all this stuff. And it is awesome, right? But what happens if the shields go down? Well, they've got the hole. What happens if they cut into the hole? They've got these inner shields that, you know, lock things down so that people aren't getting sucked into space, right? It is a great, it's a great example of defense in depth. And yes, I, you, you, we can have a conversation at some point, if you'd like to, about perimeters, right? And you would argue today, especially after COVID, that perimeters have totally changed. There are still perimeters, folks. You still have to think about them, right? Um, it, it's something we should consider. But again, the castle doctrine is something you can talk about with, say, Deep Space Nine, right? But in the end, right, defense in depth is still something that we should consider and can be used uh, and, and taught using Star Trek as an example. All right, Star Wars. Where's my Star Wars people at, right? Awesome, good, bad, and gray spaces. Then the 19th, so Star Wars has been around for a long time. Um, and I love Star Wars, right? Because it'll you can use it to teach the the good, the bad, and the gray, right? So the rebels are the blue, they're, they're the blue side, right? The empires, the red space are the bad guys, right? And then the Mandalorians, they're the ones in the middle there, and you probably don't want to hire them. Probably don't probably a bad idea, right? It's also a great way to describe and talk to, right, what you see in terms of what's on the internet. The internet is is not good, right? It is gray and red, right? Your network is technically the only good, but I don't even trust stuff in my own network, right? So we want to think about that. Another thing that you can do with Star Wars that is super fun, right, is talk about tools and intent. So how many of you, you know, if you work in the biz or you're working to get into the biz, have had a conversation with somebody that says, oh my gosh, that Kali Linux thing is the worst thing ever. I can't believe that's even allowed to be used by people. I've had this conversation. I kid you not, right? Kali Linux, any pen testing platform, any tool that's out there on the internet is no different than a lightsaber. If you pick up Kali Linux, and you use it for good, you know, and mapping your environment, doing pen testing in your environment with permission, of course, all of those things, right? You are truly have good intent. You're an ethical person. You have a blue lightsaber. If you decide in your heart of hearts that you want to just hack some stuff and you use Kali Linux for that, right? Kali Linux isn't bad. The tools on Kali Linux are bad. The people that wrote the tools. Okay, now granted, there are some people out there that write tools for bad. I'll grant you that, right? But if you take the tools, right, that are on Kali Linux and you use them for bad, you're wielding a red lightsaber, right? Inherently, tools, information, things like that, they're not bad, folks, right? It's all about the intent and in how you decide to use them. This is a good show, by the way. Started off a little slow and then got more interesting. People would argue that we didn't need this show, but I thought it was cool anyways. Ah, vulnerabilities and insiders. So uh, Rogue One, Rogue One is an awesome example of the truly malicious insider, right? So we know Jen Urso's dad, Galen Urso, is, you know, he plants the bug, right? He plants the bug that allows Luke Skywalker and his X-Wing squadron to swoop in in Star Wars A New Hope and destroy destroy the Death Star, right? So that was the insider piece, right? But again, it's also vulnerabilities. It's also vulnerabilities. Think about what the, you know, the council of people, right? And it's really interesting, right? You know, you had a whole bunch of, you know, Moff Tarkin, right? And uh, and the I, and our I, the ISB guy, right? Colonel Ularn, you had all these people in this room, right? And they all sat around the table feeling good about themselves saying, you know what? This is great, right? We don't have anything to worry about. We've got the Death Star. And then they realized 
halfway through the attack that the small ships were getting past these big old turbo lasers that were really meant to defend the Death Star against bigger ships and that they were going to actually do some damage, right? So vulnerabilities. I love this one for vulnerabilities because, 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 because vulnerabilities, great and small, can be a problem for you. In fact, I would argue that a vulnerability, right, that is easy and a medium is of more and, and is, is of more concern than a high that you have to get through three layers of a firewall to get after. Okay, so analysts can really use that kind of data. One thing I'll show in shameless plug, right? If you've never heard of the known exploited vulnerabilities catalog from CISA, you should actually just Google that. CISA, CISA known exploited vulnerabilities catalog. Um, these are all of the vulnerabilities that CISA's work with multiple agencies and organizations to identify that are being exploited in the world live right now, right? There's about, oh, uh, like almost 860 of them at this point, right? Definitely. Oh, thanks, James. Appreciate you throwing it in there, right? If you're not aware of that, this is something you should be aware of, right? This is something that's like data you can grab and use for your organization right now. So excellent stuff. Thanks, James. Um, so again, vulnerabilities and insider. Star Wars is fraught with this. Right. Every single, if you need a really good example, you can find it in Star Wars. Ah, Star Wars, to social engineering and tailgating. Right. If you've, have, has anybody watched the new Andor show? Right. I know it's the lowest rated show so far, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it is the most intellectual Star Wars show that I've seen. And I love it. I'm just, I'm just like, I'm kind of a nerd guy, but they have all this, like, there's like all this intrigue and everything like that. Well, one of the things that happens in the Andor show, as you see in the picture here, is that they, the, 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 the protagonists dress up in Imperial uniforms to sneak into a facility to do rebel activities. And I'll leave it at that if you haven't seen it. This is an ex excellent example of why we shouldn't let people tailgate. This is, tailgate. This is an excellent example of why we should check badges if you're in an organization that's got badges. This is why, and we've been taught this in the military, if you see somebody walking around in your spaces and you don't know who they are, you should do the right thing and stop them asking questions. This is why we do that, right? It's, social engineering is a huge thing. You can look across multiple uh, movies today, and there's a little bit of social engineering in lots of movies, not just science fiction. So please take a look at those. Use those, right? This is one of those things where we have these great stories. Make your cybersecurity training memorable for your, uh, you know, for your users, for the people that are participating in this trainings. Ah, the diamond model, diamond model, right? Again, this one's a little nerdy, right? So, but if you really wanted to describe, I love sneakers as well, Ron, it's a great movie. Um, if you want to describe how the diamond model works, use this one, right? This is from Threat Connect. It's a really great example. In this case here, the victim is Emperor Palpatine and the owner and the asset is the Death Star and they are aggressed by, uh, you know, by the rebels and by Luke Skywalker as the adversary, right? So this is a funny way to describe how this works. If you need to, you know, educate a user base on models, right? Use, use, use science fiction movies, right? Star Wars is great for this. I love this model. This is not my idea. This is a great idea. Uh, the, the analyst that came up with this, I just chuckled. I love this one. You know, what are the cap, you know, again, uh, diamond models, adversary infrastructure, victim and capabilities. This is a great way to, to, to share this with people. All right, I've got some closing slots and I'll leave a few minutes for questions and conversation. Um, you know, some some stuff, right? One, hopefully you've had fun today. Hopefully you've laughed a little bit. Hopefully you've, you've said, oh, I didn't think about, you know, using that to educate users. Learning should be fun, folks, right? I don't like, I don't, I don't like boring stuff. Boring is not fun, right? Boring is not fun and I forget about it, right? So learning should be fun. If it's networked or not, it's gonna, it's hackable. Right. Don't be don't be that organization that thinks because you put stuff out, you know, a, you know, and it's isolated somewhere in the woods somewhere that somebody isn't going to want to run across it and try to connect to it because they will. Right. There is. So the next two are kind of linked. There is no perimeter, but there are perimeters. They're just different. Um, you know, we live in a world like I'm, I'm giving you this presentation from my home office. I work for my home office. Right. The world has changed since COVID and was changing even before then. So we have to think about that. We have to think about the fact that our users now 
are working in completely different locations than we ever thought that they would. And we have to understand that and we have to educate them on those potential risks. You got to defend in depth. Yep, I know people will tell you that defense in depth is dead. You still have to defend in depth. You got to start at the core of your business with your data and your work your way out beyond the perimeter. And I'm telling you today, folks, we have a massive problem with, with data loss, right? If you have a, a smartphone and you access, you know, your uh, you know, your company's data without MDM and, you know, mobile device management or something like that on your personal smartphone, you've got a problem, right? So we got to defend in depth and we got to understand what that means today because it is totally changed. Don't trust, don't trust the Mandalorians. We know this. We don't trust the Mandalorians. And okay, so, and finally, right? So you're going to help me with my closing thought. What do you think I'm going to say for my and finally, right? Throw it in the chat pod there. What do you think I'm going to say? Right, I've talked about a whole bunch of things. You got this is like I'm re I'm ready, right? Uh, I the, the this is kind of the fun part, right? What do you think? Right, up, oh, live long and pro. Okay, I like that one. That's a good one, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, what another one? That's a, one more, one more, and then I'll then we'll get to my end finally. Change your password. Oh, yep, I could potentially do that one as well. But just because I want you to laugh at the end of this, right? Oh, oh, look at I love that. I love it. I love it. Right? Is have you seen my stapler? Have you seen my stapler? Um, I'm pretty sure my stapler, oh, I don't know. I think my kids took my stapler. Oh, no, there it is. Look at, it's not a red stapler, but I have seen my stapler, right? I always try to flip that one on you and make you think about that, right? So hopefully, folks, this was exceptionally fun for you. You got a good laugh at this. Um, please, like I said, love for you to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I've got a couple minutes left. I'll hang. Are there any questions that I can answer? Uh, or again, I'm always open to new suggestions for movies and stuff like that. I should can close on this, right? Um, hey, Ed, good to see you as well. Um, would love to, like I said, would love to see you, um, you know, on LinkedIn, uh, meet up with you, right? Um, but uh, hopefully this is fun and I'll hang out uh, and see if there's any uh, questions uh, that I can answer or conversations that need to be had. So, and if not that, have a great rest of your day. I know the main session is going to pick back up here in a second. They're going to award uh, the the stuff for the capture the flag and close things out. And, you know, have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks for being here. For those of you, thanks for your service, right? Thanks for all the things that you do. We appreciate you. And if you're coming new into the business, you know, like I said, hit us all up. We would love uh, to you. Oh yeah. I love that one. It's like show stack stuff is great. It's great. In fact, I got show stacks book right here, believe it or not. No kidding. It's funny that you bring that up, Ron. Look at here's the book. Here's show stacks book. <laughs> That's awesome. Right? So again, thanks for your service. If you're transitioning into business, right? There's so many great people in here. Hit us all up on LinkedIn, right? Let us help you. Let us get you. Let, let us get you into the mix. We need more of you, uh, you know, helping to defend, you know, our uh, helping to defend our 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 entities, our assets, our networks. The world is not any less complicated today. So thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your weekend.